The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jake Reynolds, and um, I'm responsible for research at uh, the Institute for Sustainability Leadership at the University of Cambridge. Really big welcome to all of you who are able to attend this afternoon. A big thanks for making the time. We have um, a really interesting presentation ahead of us from Dr. Gabriel Ocello, who will get to in just a minute, who's one of our Prince of Wales Global Sustainability Fellows at the at CISL, working on air quality and uh, funded by AstraZeneca, who uh, all of you uh, will have heard of. Well, the just to say a, a couple of things about the, the programme before we get started with uh, looking at all of the uh, ins and outs of Gabriel's research. I think the thing about this particular presentation is that it encompasses a, an awful lot of sustainability issues in one project. So everything from understanding air quality and its impact on health, but all the way through to the solutions in terms of how we might deal with different sources of air pollution, which are affecting people's lives. And of course, that takes us into the whole area of green transition. And in this case, as you'll find out, uh, e-mobility and the electrification of transport, in Gabriel's case, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. The, we're looking at the participation uh, of the people who signed up for this event. I think there is something in it for everyone. And uh, I noticed that a number of insurance companies, investment organizations, pharmaceutical sector, um, research organizations, and indeed uh, e-mobility startup in particular, and financial institutions all expressed interest in this uh, particular event. And I, thinking about the actual topic area, whether it's green transition or working on solutions for improvement in health, job creation, mitigating climate change, this particular research touches on all of that. So I hope there's something that everyone can take away. The Prince of Wales programme overall is uh, started really in 2018. It's, um, it's, it's unusual in the university in that the questions which it looks at are co-designed with industry. So we very specifically set out at the start to think about research areas which have maximum potential for impact in the economy. And that's absolutely the case in, in this particular example, which we designed at the outset uh, with uh, a broad group, which included AstraZeneca uh, from the pharmaceutical and science industry. I think the thing to say about the, um, about the program though, is it's, it sort of combines the University of Cambridge's strengths in research with a particular focus on impact, which is not straightforward for researchers to achieve. But I think if you listen carefully to, to Gabriel, you'll see how he's going about that. It's a lot to do with stakeholder engagement, good communications, and thinking about where the research thinking which we're generating is going to land, and how best to engage with those stakeholders right at the beginning and throughout the research process, uh, rather than leave results to uh, have their impact at the end of a project. So um, I, I, in terms of sort of the, the structure of the, of the afternoon, um, or in fact, probably getting on for early evening for those joining us from um, at least parts of Eastern Africa, we'll, um, we'll probably hear from Gabriel for about 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll get into Q&A. And looking at the uh, GoToMeeting uh, software, which we're using, uh, for this meeting. I hope you're all navigating that effectively. There is a chat uh, function and I would encourage you to put questions into that chat function uh, so that we can hear from you. Anything on your mind as we go through, pop a question in and we'll come back to those questions after Gabriel's finished his presentation. So um, I think that's all from me. I've simply introduced uh, Gabriel and his uh, given you a sort of in a nutshell version of what he's going to be talking about. I should just say briefly that Gabriel uh, joined us from the Liverpool uh, uh, Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, where he did postdoctoral research. And before that, he did his PhD in the University of Aberdeen. And uh, uh, obviously, um, it has been greatly aided this research by the fact that uh, Gabriel is a Ugandan national and knows the the field, if you like, knows the research site, in this particular case, Kampala, 
in Uganda very, very well and has a lot of prior experience of working with uh, stakeholders, including in the policy community. So he's um, excellently prepared for uh, his fellowship here in Cambridge. And um, I'm going to turn over to you, Gabriel. You have the slides working. I'm going to go on mute and um, I look forward to what you have to say. Okay, thanks a lot, Jake, and thanks for the wonderful uh, introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Um, glad you could uh, spare time and uh, be with us uh, for this webinar. As Jake introduced me, my name is uh, Gabriel Okello. I'm uh, Prince of Wales Global Sustainability Fellow in uh, Air Quality and Non-Communicable Diseases. And um, my fellowship is uh, exploring uh, uh, collaborative ways of uh, co-designing interventions to address um, air pollution uh, in Uganda at the moment. Uh, I'm currently working with stakeholders in policy, stakeholders in business, academia, to generate evidence, which evidence we are using to co-design strategies to address air pollution in the capital city of Uganda, which is Kampala, and another secondary city in Uganda, which is uh, Jinja. And we aim for these uh, interventions to be uh, not only holistic, we aim for them to be evidence-based, but we also aim for interventions that uh, can be replicated in other urbanizing cities in sub-Saharan Africa. My fellowship is uh, funded by a philanthropic gift from uh, AstraZeneca. So today I will be uh, I'll be explaining and taking you through uh, one of the work streams of uh, my fellowship, which is uh, looking at uh, exploring pathways to a just transition to uh, two-wheeled motorcycles, which uh, we commonly call border borders in the in the East African region. Um, when you go to the West African region, you might find another name being used, um, uh, i.e. Okada. Um, so with this presentation, I will take you through uh, the regional overview in terms of the numbers, uh, how these border borders uh, are being used uh, within the region, uh, the challenges that uh, have come up with uh, the accelerated adoption of these border borders, and how some of these challenges have been addressed or some of the proposals that are on the table for addressing uh, challenges from border borders. And then I will take you through the co-design co approach that uh, I, together with the collaborators in this fellowship, are using. Uh, I'll give you a glimpse of what we know so far, and then uh, explain to you a bit about the pilot of the transition to electric mobility. And then finally, we'll wrap it up with the uh, potential enabling factors and barriers. So let's first start with the, the regional overview of the two-wheeled uh, motorcycles, uh, which we commonly know as border borders in the East African region. We have uh, approximately 4.7 million uh, petrol-powered two-wheeled motorcycles in the region, uh, with Uganda taking a share of uh, 1.2 million motorcycles. And these motorcycles within the region carry approximately 75 million people through the congested cities of uh, East Africa, but also through the peri-urban and rural areas. And, the, and, one of the, uh, and some of the main reasons as to why these two-wheeled motorcycles form a very strong fabric in transportation within, uh, with, within a mobility context is A, they, they save time, uh, due to uh, due to their ability to maneuver and weave through the the traffic, as I, I'll, I'll show you uh, some pictures in the in the following slides, and also the, uh, their their ability to be able to maneuver the the sometimes narrow roads uh, in the different uh, areas, either within the city or in the rural areas. Um, giving them also the ability to access uh, these remote areas. So how are these uh, two-wheel motorcycles, commonly known as border borders, currently being utilized? Uh, they're being utilized to transport people uh, to and from work, um, transport people from one area to another, 
transporting school children uh, from home to school and from school back to home. Um, within uh, within uh, different uh, localities, especially in the peri-urban and rural areas, uh, these border borders are also uh, being used as ambulances to transport uh, uh, patients to, to the hospitals or to the health centers. And with the recent boom of, um, of uh, e-commerce uh, within the region, um, border borders are really, uh, are really playing a pivotal point in not only delivery, but in the last mile distribution in the various locations. The other uh, substantial use border borders have been, uh, have, have been applied is uh, monitoring of projects, uh, be it uh, government projects or international uh, aid projects uh, within agriculture, within forestry, uh, within local government, et cetera. So they are really, uh, really of uh, very significant use within the mobility context in the sub-Saharan African settings. Um, border borders have, are, also, are also being used in uh, transporting uh, medical samples from uh, rural health centers, mainly the rural health centers or smaller health centers to, to the big uh, health centers. And that is uh, reducing the turnaround time of getting uh, results for for the for the patients and uh one of the other really uh really important use uh, important utilization for this border borders is that they have provided employment uh uh throughout the whole supply chain uh, be it the riders um the mechanics um the the wholesalers the importers etc however with all these benefits border borders have also come with um, with challenges um, in the in the community, and one of the biggest challenges um, is um, air pollution, um, uh, which is as a result of um, which is as a result of uh, borders having both two-stroke and four-stroke engines that uh, do not uh, that do not efficiently burn the fuel. So we having a uh, Air pollution um, rapidly increasing uh, within settings uh, that these border borders are being used, and when we breathe in uh, these pollutants, they cause uh, both short-term and long-term respiratory illnesses, uh, from the from exacerbating uh, illnesses like uh, asthma to long-term illnesses like lung cancer. These are also further going ahead to uh, cause absence of uh, children from school and also uh, people from work and people are spending what would have actually been avoided on treating these diseases. Uh, this air pollution um, is also causing uh, premature deaths, um, premature deaths not only in Uganda but all over the world. And I've given some statistics uh, for Uganda air pollution is responsible for over 30,000 deaths every year. On the African continent, um, that's approximately uh, air pollution is causing uh, around 1.1 million deaths, and globally, um, air pollution is causing um, 7 million deaths, premature deaths every year. Now, we need to sit back and let these numbers sink in to understand the sheer challenge of uh, this cross-cutting issue that we are dealing with, and to just bring that closer to um, to what we've been um, to what we've been exposed to in the past two years. Um, I've tried to bring those numbers and compare them with COVID uh, from this from the World Health Organization data. So COVID in the in the approximate two years, it has been with us as uh, killed um, approximately six million people. Uh, compared to that to air pollution, which is all, which is also killing uh, seven million people every year. In my opinion, um, air pollution is another pandemic we have uh, right beneath our noses, as uh, much as uh, it is invisible most of the time. The other challenge: um, this this air pollution contributes to uh, climate change, um, so it affects the environment. Um, the borders within these settings are also starting to contribute to uh, congestion. I'll just play for you a, a, a small clip. Um, the congestion within these settings 
because of the sheer numbers, especially during the rush hours. And also the maintenance of these uh, border borders in unregulated uh, garages uh, is causing soil pollution as uh, some of these oils are poured um, onto, into the ground. Uh, the, one of the challenge, other challenges that has uh, come up as a result of using these uh, borders has been uh, you know, physical injury um, and deaths as a result of uh, accidents. So with all these challenges, um, next I would want us to look at uh, you know, some of the proposed challenges or some of the challenges that have been uh, implemented to try and uh, some of the interventions that have been implemented to try and tackle these challenges. One of the major proposed one, which keeps uh, coming back and forth for the for the case of Kampala, is you know having a border border free zone in the in the in the central business district, um, and this um, surfaces uh, once in a while. And uh, th this is the this is the latest uh, this is the latest proposed ban from borders. Um, in terms of uh, decongesting the city centre, I think this will absolutely um, achieve uh, that aim, but in terms of um, uh, tackling air pollution, I, re I have my doubts as you just redistributing uh, air pollution sources within the outskirts of the city center. So the net effect on the whole city uh, might not be significant um, in terms of um, air pollution. Uh, the other, you know, the other interventions that have uh, come up uh, you know, rigor, rigorous training uh, of the riders uh, by the different border border associations and different um, air riding companies um, in terms of safety, in terms of riding. And this has seen uh, uh, a reduction in the number of accidents um, that are being experienced. Another intervention has been uh, uh, piloting of uh, non-motorized corridors uh, within the city um, uh, to, to try and um, encourage uh, non-motorized transport. But a big question still um, lingers around when you're looking at all these uh, challenges in that we still have, for the case of Uganda, we have uh, 1.2 million petrol-powered motorcycles within the country with, uh, with over 400,000 uh, in the Kampala metropolitan area, and we ha we still have a huge number of these petrol-powered uh, motorcycles being imported every day. And one of the considerations we are looking at, with we, we have been looking at with uh, the collaborating partners, is uh, how uh, is the inclusivity of uh, you know some of these interventions. It is very important to note that uh, much as the the border border riders uh, are major contributors to air pollution by riding these motorcycles. They are also victims of this air pollution because they are in proximity, or they are in proximity where these uh, emissions, uh, where the air, pollu air, air pollutants are being emitted. So it's also good to put that into context. So um, this leads us to the co-design approach in, in this work stream where, we've been, uh, where we are exploring pathways to transition to electric uh, two-wheelers. Um, and in this co-design, uh, I'm working with uh, partners in academia uh, to, ob to obtain the air quality data from Kampala and analyzing it. Uh, that's uh, through Makere Air Corps. We've been correlating the air quality data and health with uh, uh, the Makere Lung Institute. And we are planning to model the potential effects of uh, accelerated adoption of this electric uh, transition with, um, with, with, a, with a, a group from the University of Birmingham. We, we are working with the policymakers, um, mainly the Ministry of Energy and Ministry of Transport, to co create. Um, an electric uh, mobility policy guide, because this is a relatively new technology uh, within the country, and there has to be uh, standards uh, around the, the batteries and the units that are coming in. I uh, will also working in collaboration with the Minister of Health to obtain the health data, which we are 
trying to explore how it correlates with the air pollution we are receiving. One of the other things we intend to look at is to explore the cost benefit analysis of this uh, transition with the policymakers in terms of the physical impact uh, for the, you know, for, 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 for the government. Um, the other partner we're working with is uh, Mojo Energies, which is retrofitting uh, the existing petrol powered uh, motorcycles into electric and is also providing the charging infrastructure with these electric uh, powered motorcycles being fed into the NFT mobility uh, ecosystem. NFT mobility is, our business, is the business partner we're working with. So NFT is providing us an ecosystem for, oper for operations of uh, petrol powered and electric, uh, electric powered uh, motorcycles. And with this, we're able to get uh, first hand end user feedback uh, from the riders themselves and we're able to get uh, data being collected by the by NFT mobility, which and with all this data, we 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 keep on um, meeting with uh, different uh, collaborating partners to explore how we can we can continue co-designing uh, this intervention, whilst also looking at uh, potential unintended consequences, both positive and uh, negative. What do we know so far? Um, air, air pollution is a serious challenge in Kampala, and uh, the fine particles uh, in the outdoors are the annual averages are 12 times uh, more than the recommended uh, WHO limits. Uh, what we have also found out that uh, over 60% of the air pollution within Kampala through a pilot, uh, over 60% uh, comes from combustion sources which include uh, uh, motor vehicles, motorcycles, um, and also over 30,000, we're having over 30,000 premature deaths in Uganda. From the electric transition side, one of the, one, one of the, the, the evidence we've generated is that uh, with the pilot existing, is that running an electric motorbike is actually cheaper uh, than uh, running a petrol powered uh, motorbike. Uh, the current numbers are ranging, are averaging $7 for the petrol powered versus uh, $5 for the electric uh, per day. And the, the other advantage the electric has that there's no changing um, clutches or oil uh, every six to eight weeks. And how is this uh, retrofitting uh, actually taking place? I just want to give you uh, an overview. So the old petrol powered the old petrol powered motorcycle is taken to uh, the retrofit uh, garage. This is at Mojo. It's stripped apart, and then uh, the the electric retrofit component is fitted uh, plus the battery, and then you have your electric uh, motorcycle. What what are, what benefits? Uh, do we envisage from this? One is uh, this zero tailpipe emission directly tackles uh, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest challenges we are having in uh, motorized mobility, which is air pollution and its related burden of disease. And by also tackling the tailpipe emission, uh, we're mitigating uh, climate change and contributing to Uganda's uh, nationally determined contributions. Also, this electric transition from the pilot was seeing that uh, it's increasing the income of uh, the riders uh, because they are spending less operationally, but also because they are victims and they are in the front line in the proximity of the of the pollutants. We've, we also envisage that uh, a reduction in local air pollution from mobility would also improve their, their would also improve their health. Uh, also emphasize reduction in uh, soil pollution caused by the unsafe disposal. And uh, one of the, the the unintended consequences we are we are seeing is the potential uh, creation of tens of thousands of green jobs. And I will explain about. Uh, 
each potential step in of the job creation ecosystem in the in the next slide so this uh, this transition potentially has uh, can provide uh, employment one for the for the retrofit providers you have people being employed there you have uh, people being employed at the charge and swap stations this is where the batteries are charged and then uh, and are swapped for those that have been depleted in power there's a potential employment for insurance providers who will be insuring uh, uh, who will be insuring these assets um, in the payment process system because uh, the, 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 peop, the riders come and pay for a battery that is fully charged. There's a potential creation of employment there also. And then with the people managing the, the, the battery platform, the battery support platform, this is a platform which alerts the, which, which alerts the driver uh, on A, uh, the percentage of uh, charge he has on his battery, but also B would be able to to alert him on the nearest charge station. That is also potential for for job creation. Asset financing, um, depending on 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 the model being used, uh, there is uh, a really huge potential for financing these assets, and there is uh, also potential in job creation in terms of uh, people regulating the policymakers regulating the standards of. Uh, batteries coming in, the, start, the operational standards on ground. And another area for job creation is the maintenance and repair. So we are looking at a fully blown green ecosystem of job creation with this, uh, with this transition. And what are some of the quite interesting enabling factors we found out from, from our partners? You know, from the Ministry of Energy, we found out that uh, over 90% of our electricity is uh, from renewable sources. That is the hydro and solar, which is uh, which is a fantastic thing because your major source of electricity uh, might have, uh, affects your net effect of uh, electric transition as you move along the, the value chain. We have uh, very vibrant. Uh, youth population that is ready to take up these jobs. So this will be closing the unemployment gap. Um, the, and there's practically minimal behavior change for the border borders in uh, transiting to, to electric. However, there are, there are factors to consider in order to accelerate this adoption. Um, one is the huge financial cost uh, in in setting up the infrastructure, be it the charging infrastructure or the retrofit infrastructure or the training of the of the technicians themselves. I know Mojo and NFT do a little bit of training and it's uh, quite a bit um, from their numbers. It's, uh, it, it doesn't come cheap. Then also from the policy and regulation angle, this is a relatively new technology. Uh, there needs to be a policy uh, in on in place to uh, a regulate um, the the existing entities, but also regulate the the newcomers and sort of set standards, uh, minimum standards along the, the value chain. Uh, there is also need of building capacity and skill. Um, there will be need to upskill and reskill um, the existing um, the the existing um, engineers and people in the various uh, in the various stages of the supply chain uh, there's uh, it's a new technology so there is need for continuous monitoring to identify a uh, the data gaps in terms of uh, in terms of the technology of the batteries in terms of the charging infrastructure etc and uh, there is need for awareness um, the, the awareness about um, electric mobility is still low within uh, within the country, um, and one of the things that uh, we need to plan for um, in the sub-Saharan African context is to plan for the e-west because uh, within a few years, three to five years, we shall start having uh, exponential amounts of e-west. So it is very very vital to start planning that uh, 
from the onset, as we plan for the acceleration, we also plan for how that uh, electric waste uh, will be handled uh, five, years, five years down the road. And with that, I really thank you for taking the time and I, I'm happy to answer any questions or clarify on any discussion points. Thank you very much. Over to you, Jake. Uh, thanks so much. <clears throat> thanks so much, Gabriel. Really interesting. Let me just put my camera back on. The um, yeah, I told you this. Um, uh, I, I told you this was a this was a piece of research that had many fingers in many different uh, sustainability pies, and I think you can see that there, even the financing one, because I did notice that um, we have a number of financial institutions on the on the call, also some energy companies. And you can just see that this transition, which Gabriel has outlined, it, it's uh, it's only feasible from a particularly from a climate perspective, if the electricity going into the electrification of of, of the bikes is renewable. I mean, that's that's when you get the greatest winds and the greatest synergy across the energy system and the transport system. So I think that's a good illustration. Um, it's really interesting to hear from you as well, Gabriel, you know, as an epidemiologist, Gabriel is an epidemiologist. He comes from uh, a scientific background studying, you know, the progress of disease, but he finds himself at the center of a, a set of stakeholders working on the solutions to air quality or air, air pollution, I should say. And that's, that is, in itself is an interesting transition, I think. What, what's a, uh, many of his colleagues in epidemiology would probably draw the line and say, look, I'm going to study the impact of air pollution on disease, but not necessarily take that extra step to see how solutions can be built around and work with stakeholders on the solutions rather than uh, defining the problem in, in ever more detail. And that's something I really think is very valuable in the way that um, Gabriel's working. Uh, what I, I mean, I, there's quite a few questions which I'll just come to in a second because people have been um, uh, my colleague Jan has been uh, reposting some of them to me to, to, to keep up. What I just wanted to ask is a very simple one to start with, Gabriel. The um, the retrofit the retrofitted it bikes the the bikes which are taken off the road and their engines are transitioned from uh, you know petrol driven to electric. That is in itself an interesting sustainability um, opportunity because we're not talking about dependence on newly imported bikes and wasting the ones the, the existing fleet. We're talking about converting the existing fleet which in my mind is i wanted to ask whether that is in itself uh something which has got environmental um performance uh you know as it as its driver rather than sort of waste a lot of bikes and sort of let them decay and and, and become residual you've actually got a process it seems to actually you know modernize them and uh, modernize the existing fleet which i think is significant and i did just want to ask on the on the actual bikes can they stand up to a typical, you know, Kampala tropical storm with, with all that electric components? Have they been proofed against that? Are they, is there anything about the road system in somewhere like Kampala, which is not always um, as, as its citizens would like, that would mean that these bikes were any more vulnerable uh, given the kind of some of the sophistication of their engines, et cetera. So a couple of questions there about the bikes. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Jake. And uh, one, to answer the question of uh, uh, retrofitting the existing petrol fueled um, motorbikes, I think there is a direct net gain if we are retrofitting the existing to electric, as opposed to bringing in um, a new electric motorbike and probably pushing uh, this old one to, you know, to either a rural area um, or outside the city. Um, in, in, in my, in my in my research, I, I just, as a person researching about air quality, I just look at that as redistributing the the, the, the source of uh, air pollution from one area to another, but not uh, you may not have uh, an, an, a, net, a net effect um, in trying to reduce uh, air pollution. So uh, I, th I think with the retrofit, A, you're having a net effect with um, reducing that, with uh, eliminating the tailpipe, but also you're providing so I would call it like extended life to this uh, motorcycle. 
but your follow-on question is actually a very important one about um, how these uh, electric bikes might be able to handle the you know the the roads in um, in, in, in a typical sub-Saharan African setting like Kampala, where we have uh, uh, we have the challenge of potholes, and you know we're talking about electric components uh, fused together. We, you, we're talking about uh, rainy season where the water floods, and then we have dry season where there's a lot of dust. So one of um, the, you know th this is relatively a new pilot, but one of the directions uh, uh, we've taken in the research is we're partnering uh, with um, a team from uh, Oxford Brooks that. Uh, is involved in sustainable transport frame design, and th th this is their bread and butter. This is this is what this is what they do, and the aim of that is to to in to in in future design a frame a locally a locally designed frame meant for the terrain of sub-Saharan Africa. So th th that is the that is the direction the research has, has taken in in terms of uh, having a, a frame that is built for, an electric frame that is built for the, the local context. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, we have a few questions here, so um, uh, I'm just gonna crack on. Um, we've got one about the, the actual air pollution source. So the question is how much of the air pollution is actually from the exhaust of the Boda Boda, the e Boda, that the, 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 the motorbike? And how much is about the resuspension of dust and brake wear and tire wear? I think it's a really that's a very sharp question because it, you know there's multiple sources of emissions or disturbance yes. that come from the bikes. I know you've been looking yes. at that. Yes, uh, yes. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, that's a very that's a very important question. In terms of the actual components from the motorcycle. Uh, we haven't um, we haven't yet characterized uh, the different uh, the, the different the different particles from the from the exhaust resuspended dust and also from other vehicles because uh, you have to notice that these uh, motorcycles are not moving in a vacuum so where they are moving there are also cars besides them um, you have uh, a roadside a, a, a roadside kiosk people frying and everything. But that is one of the the, the steps we are uh, we are exploring with um, a couple of partners. Um, one is the University of Birmingham and also the University of Colorado Boulder, uh, together with Airco, where we shall characterize uh, the 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 air the air pollution components, and then we'll be able to clearly say X is from uh, motorcycles. Y is from uh, maybe cooking sources. This one is from uh, industries. So yeah, that is still a, a, work, a work in progress with the partners. Reminds me of the um, the hope that uh, electric uh, cars, for example, and other vehicles would have a major reduction on noise pollution, another source of pollution from transport. But of course, it's only partly true because only part of the noise is actually from the engine. And um, quite a lot of it's from tires and, and other components on the um, on the vehicle, and it's a similar a little way with the air pollution question. We have another question here about um, a very relevant and topical one about sourcing of key uh, materials for the electric mobility system, so things like nickel, cobalt, palladium, platinum, um, and the question about how the crisis in Ukraine might affect, I suppose, global supply to some of these important elements uh, necessary for. Uh, e-transition of one kind or another. Um, I, I think, Gabriel, it's fair to say that at the moment the, these key components are not being manufactured in uh, in Uganda, or in fact even in Eastern Africa. They're, they're, for example, in the main imported from countries like China. So I guess uh, the stability of the supply to Uganda itself at this point in time, who knows in the future, may be more dependent on the on countries like China and their ability to respond and be resilient to you know, global supply of the key materials. Is that, I think I'm right in saying there is, they're not produced directly in the region, Gabriel? N uh, no, um, so the, the components are, are being imported from, uh, from China. They're not uh, being produced in, in the region. And you know, that goes ahead to reemphasize how um, 
how how complex this uh, supply chain is um with the components uh coming in from you know china then uh, we have uh, them being received in uganda and then we try to do the retrofitting yeah but uh of course uh supply chain issues would will definitely have an impact on um on, yeah. on the retrofit and acceleration of uh transition ironically um and i believe Uganda is a, an exporter of cobalt, as are some countries very similar. So I just have this image of cobalt traveling from Uganda to China and then coming back in a in a different form. Um, that would be the characteristic of some uh, global supply chains. Um, next question is, if there was to be a really radical shift in um, e-mobility, towards e-mobility in a country like Uganda, clearly that would create a, a more significant dependence um, or demand for power, electric power in the country. Um, any ideas from you, Gabriel, about how the, the current power generation set up the network would be able to handle uh, a, a significant increase in demand? Uh, so currently, um, Uganda uh, produces more electricity than it needs, and it's exporting uh, um, some to the neighboring countries, um, including uh, Kenya, um, and the, it, it's it's it, it's it's uh, difficult to say how a surge in mobility um, will will affect the current uh, power power supply uh, or the current power uptake. Uh, but it's fair to say that. Uh, of course, uh, an accelerated increase will lead to um, increased demand in power. Or uh, what I what I know for sure is uh, they are there. There have been uh, hydro hydro power stations that have been launched uh, recently by the government, and there is also uh, there, there is also an option of solar. Um, Uganda has uh, the sun for almost all year round, even during the rainy season. So there is an, there is an option of, of using solar to charge these uh, stations. Uh, thank you, Gabriel. In fact, we have Sana Markinen from, um, uh, from CRSL. He's been studying some of that new hydro generation in Uganda. So I'm sure we can follow up with her um, offline. It's a question here about e-waste. You mentioned it in your presentation, Gabriel, about you know if there's a significant investment now in the um, in battery powered mobility, how that might lead ultimately, and, and other components of an electrified engine, how that might lead to an e-waste challenge. What What's the state of play in terms of waste management generally in a city like Kampala? And do you think there is scope for responsibly and effectively managing any e-waste impacts which might result from this transition? I think um, for waste in general, um, and that is um, organic waste, which uh, you know I have uh, uh, quite some evidence about, is uh, it's it's the, the management um, of waste uh, has not been up to scratch, and for the e-waste to now be come uh, to now be looking as a pot as a po as a pot possibility within uh, the three to five years i think this is a, one of the key areas that uh, uh government and other stakeholders need to need to put their focus in in order to avoid any negative unintended consequences and also avoid uh e-waste being exported to uh, other countries, and then uh, you know they take out the components, and again we we, we end up buying these uh, batteries at a more expensive uh, cost. I think setting. I know Uganda has set up an e-west. Uh, they have set up an e-west facility. It's relatively new. I think one year old. Um, I don't know whether it has uh, capacity to 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 handle um, the e-west that will come along within within the five years, but I hope that, that they will build capacity by then. Um, and I think having this e-waste would also give us um, an opportunity to recycle, you know, some of the components within this uh, within these batteries. 
I know from speaking with you before that the you know the ultimate aim here is not simply to be remain dependent on imported uh, components and batteries and and um, and whole whole motorbikes or whole, whole electric vehicles, but to develop that capacity locally in Uganda with all the job creation benefits on that. But I I suspect that uh, you know having fo focusing on that e-waste challenge at a very early stage so that it. <laughs> We, we don't inadvertently, for all the right reasons, lead to a major uh, waste uh, problem in the future is is essential. So I'm sure you may find opportunities given the the, the scale of your engagement with the uh, the policy uh, the policy developers in the, in the various ministries you've worked with in Kampala to raise that uh, to preempt those kind of uh, problems from emerging. Um, by the way, thank you very much for everyone who's been putting questions in. Uh, I'm reading more here, and there's 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 quite a few. So, but please do continue to to ask questions, and I will pose them to Gabriel. Um, I've got another one here for you, Gabriel. This is about the you mentioned this sort of concept of banning Boda Bodas from the centre of Kampala, and in fact, the question suggests that there may have been a similar ban banning of of um, of mini bus taxis or matatus in Nairobi, for example, which was short lived. This, it, it's an interesting dynamic here. On the one hand, you want to kind of reduce pollution and, 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 and traffic accidents and safety, et cetera, et cetera. But on the other hand, you want the city to operate efficiently. And the, the truth is that these motorbikes and matatus can travel places which a lot of other vehicles would struggle and, and actually do get people very efficiently from one part of the city to another. So it, how, would you like to comment on that dynamic? You know, on the one hand, we want nice, clean, safe cities. On the other hand, we, we want an efficient transport system. We are basically our Boda Boda's the future. Yes, uh, it, uh, yeah, and for me, it's been really eye-opening with uh, you know um, this 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 way of research of working with uh, different actors. Um, as as Jake mentioned earlier, you know, um, bef before this, my experience was uh, assess how air quality affects uh, people, exposure affects people, and then you know, dump the results to <laughs> to the to the policymakers. But working with uh, the different actors has made me appreciate that um, a you have to think of um, you know. Uh, are these interventions inclusive? What are the trade-offs within society? Because uh, we th these interventions can't exist in a vacuum. You know, you 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 you, you could easily say that you know burning border borders the next day. You know, you have um, one four point seven million in the region uh, sources. You know, taken out. You know, how many people have you taken out of jobs? You know, how many people have you taken out of the supply chain? And there are there are inclusive ways of uh, you know of trying to get um, these uh, these interventions across and including the beneficiaries in this because from the discussions we have had even the the border border riders themselves uh, know the know know the the the, the challenges that uh, they are experiencing even in the terms of pollution about you know constant coughing and everything and they don't like this you know though they are doing this and they. They want help. They want to work with people to find solutions to this. So for me, I think uh, trying to find you know the trade-offs, either be it maybe just have organized uh, organized routes, organized stages, organized uh, time intervals, uh, etc. Having uh, having that kind of holistic approach where you know all cards are put to the table, and then you you kind of go through one by one and. Um, Trying to get the, the best solution available, but I, I think um, from the the way border borders um, are supporting the economy, from the way uh, they are embedded in the fabric of mobility, you know, it's really difficult to just wish them away. And and I think they, they are part of the the mobility ecosystem. Thank you, Gabriel. I'm I'm left from first hand that. Um... They do have a knack of uh, getting to places which other vehicles can't get to, and that includes out of the city into the rural areas where, you know, the roads might be impassable to some larger vehicles. They're not impassable to uh, to motorcycles, and as you illustrated earlier, that can mean it is, becomes feasible to deliver uh, various supplies, of course, from e-commerce, but also health supplies, and also extract samples and and have them 
centre clinics for testing and so forth. So that there's an amazing opportunity, not just in the city areas, but but outside. Now, here's a really difficult question for you, but I think it is a, it's a fundamental one. It's the, the so-called elephant in the room, I think, for e-mobility. And that is, I'm going to read the question. It seems that the transition, the, the electric mobility transition, doesn't solve the congestion issue, despite the reduction in air pollution. What would be the alternative policy suggestions to to deal with that so clearly just having just replacing petrol motorbikes with electric motorbikes does nothing to help the congestion problem in fact they might be even more popular and it might in, inadvertently in, <laughs> increase congestion so how are you thinking about the congestion issue which is tied up with road safety and, and all kinds of other factors yeah uh, i i i think that they are the the approach um I've, I've, we've discussed with the collaborating uh, partners is uh how do we not only to look at um, border borders as a mean of, of transportation, but how are they integrated in the whole transportation model? So if we're, if we're planning, let's say, mass transit, um, you're planning that mass transit, which areas, um, what are the routes of the mass transit, and how are the border borders uh, integrated within that whole you know, transportation uh, matrix? Uh, and you know, you you we find that for this for the, the city centres, yes. Um, in terms of congestion, I, I think mass transit, uh, mass transit, and if it's electric, would be a very fantastic idea. But then these uh, these uh, mass transit uh, systems uh, move from point A to B. After that, uh, uh, out, just outside the city centres, you have very narrow roads. You have uh, different parts where border borders can be integrated. So for the for the challenge of uh, congestion, it's not uh, now there. It's for it's looking at the the whole transportation, uh, or, or the whole transportation matrix, including borders, minibuses, and buses. And I think if we looked at uh, the border borders and uh, and the mass transit systems, they can they can coexist within uh, the mobility ecosystem. Thank you, Gabriel. I, I guess one could summarize that as integrated transport planning which is of course a policy goal that many governments aspire to but really find very challenging uh, including the uk um i do recall actually seeing a because i think in, in addition to the options you mentioned there's also active travel there's the you know the, what is life like for pedestrians for cyclists etc to reduce the demand for motorized transport altogether or then virtual presence to reduce any need for movement um, but I do recall seeing a, a cyclist battling through Nairobi uh, a few years ago. And I was thinking that I was very, I was empathizing because the, it was not an environment in a very, um, you know, in a, in a, in a very um, congested uh, center of Nairobi for a, for a cyclist, yet they were trying. It was a heroic act, to be honest. And I think, you know, maybe that's part of the solution too, to improve yeah. um, active travel. Yeah, I, I think you, you yeah. could give a good description. Having an integrated uh, transport planning, I think that that, that would that so, that solves it, and th these can coexist. Border borders can coexist with mass transit, with yeah. non-motorized transport. Let's try and get a couple more questions in. There's a there's a there's a there's a really complex question here, here which I'm just going to have to um, uh, buy myself a minute to to properly absorb. But in in the meantime, I know you've done work in comparative work, as you've looked, you've done a review of the literature as I understand it looking at air pollution uh, management and, and mobility questions in different cities I think mainly across the African continent but possibly drawing on lessons learned in other parts of the world do you want to just say something briefly about that while I properly digest this question in front of me and play that back to you in a minute or so yeah yeah so uh, part of um, part of what I've been uh, working on with the uh, with, with collaborating uh, partners is uh, assessing air quality strategies uh, that have been uh, implemented uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, focusing on uh, you know who have who have developed the strategy, uh, the implementers, um, which ones have worked, which ones have not worked, and uh, what have been the both positive and negative unintended consequences um, of these interventions, and you know and. Uh, the overarching aim for this is um, because uh, if, if we're trying to tackle air pollution, which um, in most cases uh, for, for a significant part is based on, you know, 
you have you measure um you have to do continuous measuring to understand you know what you're trying to solve what are the sources etc but uh, we all know that is uh, that that capacity is not yet fully developed uh, in sub-saharan african context so with this work what we hope to do is uh, we'll have uh, those strategies that have been developed who has been you know who has been involved you know what what strategies have worked and you can be you can just dive in and see what the local context of that area and see if that can be replicated to your to your local context or what factors you need to kind of incorporate and and i think it's a it's a very uh, good way of trying to have these uh, strategies replicated in other different areas thank you gabriel the, the the question i was struggling with but i i think i've understood now is um from a, a colleague in dakar Senegal who has is noting that european countries and, and, and the us are exporting older vehicles to senegal and of course those older vehicles are not necessarily at the level of pollution management that one might aspire to um and they're they're, they're so they're, they're they're coming into a country which hasn't necessarily got the the policy established to cope with that and the management the air quality management is that i think the question is really about whether we you know whether we in the west uh, let's say europe and and the us should be doing that at all is it helpful to have that kind of flow of older vehicles into a country like senegal or uganda for that matter um or should you know should those countries be developing their own far better adapted uh, modes of transport and perhaps technologies which are more suited and more manageable uh, than the ones being imported okay um i think <laughs> yeah as rightly put it, the, the question is quite complex so th there are many there are many factors to you know to i would consider in trying to answer th this this question and also from the from the literature uh, the thing about it and it I think the buck stops with um, a policy. Uh, policy is really, really key in this. Um, I'll give an example. Um, that the, the way cars are taxed, let's say in the East African region, um, it would be if a car in the UK is probably ten thousand pounds. By the time, if I'm to get a car in the UK for ten thousand pounds, by the time it's in Uganda, it will be almost. Uh, 17,000 or 20,000 pounds with the taxation regime of cars. And you know, you're looking at a low income area, but the price has almost doubled. So in a sense, in, in a moral sense, it's, it, it, you know, you could argue, you know, it's not good for, um, it, it's not good to import, to export those uh, old cars to, you know, the, to, 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 to Africa. The other thing is that what is the policy doing to to kind of um, clamp on that? I know Kenya they they don't allow cars I think uh, older than seven years. Uganda has right. has put a policy you can't uh, employ I mean you can't import cars older than fifteen years and I think it's going to ten. So these policies uh, uh, these policies okay. in the long run can keep on trying to carve out on some of these uh, issues. Thanks, Gabriel. It, it is clearly quite uh, probably contested as well. But I mean, a 15 year old car at present might not, you know, might simply not meet the pollution emission standards that one would uh, require in, in Uganda's transitioning economy. So um, there's clearly questions around that and whether we should be doing it. Look, I'd like to thank everyone for joining uh, and, and Gabriel in particular for presenting, um, but also everyone who's answered questions, who, who's provided questions and also just listened to the story, please feel free to follow up. Gabriel's email is, uh, is, is in front of you on the screen. Um, uh, re really great to have uh, your involvement in this. I think, you know, my summary is e-mobility transition. It's, it has its issues. We have to do it responsibly, but could create a very, very inclusive and environmentally beneficial uh, contribution uh, to um, uh, not just the transport system, but, but job creation the climate commitments and getting the evidence and the the science behind the benefits to health to climate to, to you know to to, to 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 the economy seems to be a very very important part of making the case and driving that transition 
accelerating that tr transition as fast as it can possibly go to extract those benefits for both Uganda and also countries uh, which are in a similar position. So thanks very much for the presentation, Gabriel, and thanks everyone for joining and uh, look forward to the next of these uh, in due course. Thank you, Jack, for the moderation. And thanks everyone who has attended. Really appreciate it.